This video is intended for entertainment purposes only. I'm just a regular guy trying to make sense of what happened on October 1st, 2017 in Las Vegas. I have no affiliation with the government or any of its agencies. My track record stands for itself, yet continues to be questioned. This video is a departure from the typical nature of the content I've put out in the past. I'm going to ask you to speculate a bit, not on the events that transpired on October 1st, 2017, but the events that have transpired since and continue to transpire to this day. As always, I encourage you to think for yourself and believe nothing except for cold, hard evidence. But I do invite you to join me in speculating for a bit, as it may help to explain current events in the Vegas shooting research community. Without further ado... In the wake of the largest mass shooting in recent U.S. history, the world watched as one question arose unanswered. Who was Stephen Paddock and what was his motive? Blinded by their own efforts to delay release of the evidence and to seemingly cover up the details of what happened that day, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department has failed to answer this question in their final report. Who was Stephen Paddock and what was his motive? The FBI, which promised first to release its report by the one-year anniversary and then later changed that promise date to be the end of 2018, has thus far failed to answer this question. Who was Stephen Paddock and what was his motive? The mainstream media, who sued the LVMPD to cough up the evidence they had, has, after receiving that evidence, failed to answer this question. Who was Stephen Paddock and what was his motive? And lastly, the YouTube and Twitter research communities, of which I am privileged to be a part, we have also failed to answer this question. Who was Stephen Paddock and what was his motive? To sum it up, we still have no clear proven motive of what drove a 64-year-old man to rain terror on concert goers that fateful October night. We still don't have undeniable proof that he was even the person with his finger on the triggers. Who was Stephen Paddock and what was his motive? It's a simple question and it deserves a simple answer. But instead, we have theories and speculation. But the world deserves more than theories and speculation when it comes to the largest mass shooting in recent US history. The world deserves answers. I wish I had them for you. I do not. But what I do have is a new theory related to the events that happened after October 1st, 2017 and continue to happen to this day. This one is going to rub a few people the wrong way. I'm aware of that, but it must be said. Let me start by saying that many of you that have been following me for a while or know me personally already know this, but for those that don't, allow me to explain how I got involved with the Vegas shooting investigation in the first place, as I think this will partially demonstrate why I came up with this theory. My deeper involvement with the Vegas shooting research started in December 2017. I was involved earlier than that only as an observer, like many of my subscribers remain today. Starting on October 2nd, 2017, I watched with the world as the story of the shooting unfolded. I scoured the websites that I thought might provide the answers. Some of what I observed was expected, but some of it was not. There was a clear gap in the reporting that was being done by the mainstream media and the reporting that was being done on YouTube and Twitter. The mainstream was ignoring much of the video evidence being found from cell phone footage and eyewitness accounts. The YouTube community seemed to have a better grasp on this, but for obvious reasons was not presented in a, such a polished and digestible way. It gained little attention by the general public, that of uh, YouTube and Twitter. The gap between the two was large and seemed to be growing. As the days and weeks passed by, I followed both the mainstream media and YouTube reports closely, hoping for answers. I subscribed to any YouTube channels I could find reporting on the topic, and so did many of you who are watching this right now. And in December, I saw an opportunity. 
After following many YouTube channels, I began to be able to differentiate the ones that seem to be the true researchers dedicated to facts and the ones that contain mostly speculation. I also began to have a better understanding of which mainstream media news sources were doing actual research on Vegas and which ones were just passing along the news. And then I made a list. The list consisted of the following. Respected journalists, an ISIS expert, YouTube researchers, and a Route 91 witness. There were, I don't know, maybe like 10 in all total. Now, let me take a step back and tell you a little bit about me. So during my day job uh, career in IT, uh, one of my greatest pleasures and strengths has been in building and managing teams. I'm not really a quote unquote sports guy, but over the years I've found immense satisfaction in bringing people together for a common goal. This must be similar to the joy a coach for a sports team experiences by getting to know his or her players and putting them in positions where they're most likely to succeed. Uh, the opportunity I saw was to build a team of people clearly dedicated to finding the truth of what happened in Vegas and allowing them to communicate to better understand and dissect the event. I'm fully aware that I'm not the best researcher out there, not even close. But what I lack in research skills, I make up for in listening and understanding people in a team. So on December 27, 2017, I contacted each and every person on my list with a proposal. The proposal was this. I am creating a centralized team to share only facts about the Las Vegas shooting, and I want you in on it. So what happened? Well, unfortunately, my message fell mostly on deaf ears. No one responded. No one, except one person on YouTube. This YouTuber responded to me with questions. Who are you and why should I work with you? They wanted to know. Uh, these questions came as, uh, as little surprise to me as up to this point, I had mainly remained in the shadows like many of you still do. After some back and forth, we agreed to work together. Although my initial intention uh, to create a super team failed, a new team began to be assembled. This team was made up of researchers clearly dedicated to facts. It was a small team, but a very committed one. Not long after that, I started producing my own YouTube videos to help fill gaps I saw in the content being put out. My early videos had a theme of helping the community better understand how to take a fact-based approach to the investigation, some of the skills that I'd kind of gotten from IT and uh, you know troubleshooting problems. Uh, check out my videos uh, on fallacies and manipulation if you want kind of an idea of what those were like. Later, I had the pleasure of helping to organize and assemble people to attend the protest held in front of LVMPD headquarters. The attendance for that was lower than might have been expected, uh, but the quality of the attendees was top notch. Many brave souls attended and put their proverbial money where their mouth was to try and expose the LVMPD's efforts to deny access to the evidence. Uh, so fast forward a bit more uh, to when the evidence batches began to be released. I developed a method to gather and publish copies of the evidence in order to bring light to them uh, for the benefit of research. There were two other YouTubers who were instrumental in making this um, kind of part of the puzzle happen, and my gratitude to them is endless. You know who you are. Okay, so that's probably enough about me. I mainly wanted to give you a little background on how this Weg Og character came to be uh, for the purpose of illustrating my perspective of this community and kind of background. Um, so back to my theory. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about history now. Um, so when it comes to the events that spawned conspiracy theories that happened prior to October 1st, 2017, we saw, unfortunately, some really horrible real-world outcomes by those who took uh, belief in theories too far. A few examples are Sandy Hook and Pizzagate. Now, just to let you know, I'm not going to delve into these theories. There's a lot of opinion, a lot of emotion uh, surrounding these, but what I do want to talk about is their impact on the real world after they happened um, by conspiracy researchers or conspiracy theorists. So first up, Sandy Hook. Um, some of the victims' uh, families of Sandy Hook not only had to deal with the loss of their children, 
but also the harassment of those who believe the event was fake in some way. Um, the impact on this harassment to those families caused additional grief to many of them, uh, even to the point of some, uh, causing some of them to relocate. The FBI and other agencies are clearly aware of this fact. Uh, next up, Pizzagate. So those of you that followed this will already know this, but just wanted to bring it up again. So uh, the theory of a secret government pedophile ring was well circulated in conspiracy circles and websites, so much so that at one point a man decided to take it upon himself to travel with firearms to the Comet Ping Pong restaurant in D.C. and try to rescue children held ca captive. He shot up the restaurant and was arrested. Thankfully, no one was hurt in the incident, but the FBI and other agencies took note and are clearly aware of this result of conspiracy theories having real-world impacts. Okay, so I didn't want to spend too much time on those, but as you can see, um, the FBI clearly would have been aware, due to those previous incidents, of the possible impact of conspiracy researchers taking things too far and endangering the public. And because of this, it is likely that they created a team and a plan of action for future incidents if they didn't already have one. Therefore, it is my speculation that upon hearing what happened October 1st, 2017, such a plan was immediately implemented by the FBI and or other agencies, and a team was dedicated to the effort. Now, here's where we're going to get into some heavy speculation I'm going to talk about what the plan that they implemented might have looked like. And there are three steps. There are, there are three steps or pieces, I guess I should say. So step one, own and steer all the leading theories. So this step requires new or existing personalities on YouTube or Twitter accounts to take up steering one or more conspiracy theories these personalities must gain a large following in order to be effective. They will adopt and push the theories with the purpose of being aware of the opinions and intentions of those who also adopt the theory. Step number two, or part number two, will be to monitor and report risk. So this step utilizes the personalities from step one as well as others working in the background uh, on the team as resources to monitor and report on conspiracy theorists who may present a risk to those in the general population. This may involve legal or covert monitoring of email, social media accounts, and real life activities of those deemed higher risk. Knowledge of social engineering and manipulation is a must for this part. Hacking accounts, is certainly not out of the question if the risk is high. They may also use AI software to review collected data to assist in determining risk. The purpose of number two is to gather information in order to prevent events such as those that uh, transpired after Sandy Hook and Pizzagate. And then on to step three. Step three is to act. In step three, members of the, of the team from number one will utilize the information gathered in number two to act, if necessary, to protect the American population from harm. The range of actions may range from as harmless as forced closing accounts on social media, YouTube, Twitter, etc., all the way up to making arrests. Within that range is also the use of manipulation and scare tactics to prevent said theorists from taking real-world action. Scaring them into inaction trumps in-person activities such as arrests, which may spook the community into silence or force them into back channels, which would be a bad thing um, because the communications wouldn't be so transparent. And that's it. So it's a really high level view of what the plan may have looked like. Um, so as you can see, I've outlined a simple strategy that may have been implemented by the agencies in order to address lessons learned from past events, which also had a high risk of conspiracy theorists taking things too far. Of course, this is all speculation, but it does beg a certain question. Who do you trust? If you're like me, then you trust very few. You focus on the researchers that only present facts. Anyone who pushes theories without evidence, yes, I realize the contradiction here, 
should at least be viewed with a high level of speculation and at most completely ignored. The FBI report will be out soon, folks, and whatever it contains will likely cause a new influx of speculation and theories. Thankfully, the FBI and other agencies have already completely infiltrated our community so that they can fully manage the fallout of the forthcoming report. So who was Stephen Paddock and what was his motive? FBI, now that you are embedded and ready, the world is waiting for the answer. Thanks for watching. <laughs>